Well, good morning, MBF Church. Good morning, Pastor Shane. Good morning, Fred. Good to see you. Hey, we've, uh, we have a lot to celebrate and be excited about. First and foremost, it is Resurrection Sunday, and today we celebrate that Jesus is risen. Amen? Uh, amen. Um, hey, and the second thing is it, what an awesome Sunday to have our first service, in, Sunday weekend services in the building. So this is a big day for us. Uh, as you can t- probably tell, it's not quite done. We're missing little things like a parking lot, um, uh, some other stuff. So I won. I apologize. I know some of you parked all the way out in the street, and so thanks. Sorry. Uh, we we were gonna try. To, we're gonna try and get that rectified as soon as we can. There's this thing called snow that's holding us up. So, um, but we are glad that you're here. And uh, just be patient with us. We ask that you do that. And you'll see every week, you'll see some different changes and things that we're going to be having, uh, getting accomplished. Um, I, I got to do something. Uh, I, I've always wanted to do this. And, and I just feel like today is a great day to commemorate the buildings. So I'm going to ask Patrick to make sure those lights are up as high as they can. And these lights are off. And we're going to take a selfie here real quick. <laughs> can we turn these lights off, Patrick, real quick? Hang on. There we go. Okay, everyone say cheese. <laughs> All right. Fun. Okay. I will keep that. You can look for that on my uh, Instagram. All right. You can turn it back on now. Um, <laughs> well, hey, if you are new with us and we haven't met, my name is Shane. I'm the lead pastor here at MBF Church. And uh, I just want to make sure you know that we are so glad that you're here. And I want to welcome you. Uh, I would love to get a chance to get to meet you and know you. I'll be out at the Welcome Center after the uh, service and would love to get a chance to just get to know you a little bit. So please come visit me. Um, but we want this to be a place uh, that you feel welcome. So I don't know if you came today, you were invited by uh, a friend or you saw it on uh, social media or you just knew the building was getting done or someone bribed you with lunch or you know, someone dragged you here. Um, either way, we're glad you're here. And we want this to be a place that you know that you are welcome to come back to every single week. Anytime we meet, you do not have to wait for an invitation. Because this is a place we want you to know is a safe, comfortable place for you to be encouraged and learn and grow into a relationship with Jesus. Because that is what we are all about at MBF Church. So, I totally messed you up with my my thing. Sorry, Patrick. Uh, (laughs) Um. But uh, we're glad you're here. So with that, um, let's pray. And uh, we're going to talk about the resurrection today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this opportunity, this time for us to be able to come together, to worship you, um, to grow in you, God, to learn. And God, we ask that your spirit just open us up to your word. And God, we thank you for the resurrection. Because without it, we have no hope. That we thank you that you love us enough that you gave everything that we can be in relationship with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you know that at least 20 times in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see that Jesus invited people to follow him? These 20 times he invited people to follow him. He, He didn't invite them to learn from him. He didn't invite them to watch him or listen to him. He said, follow me. That's what Jesus calls us to do. Jesus asks us to follow him in this life, to to go on a journey through life with him. That's what Christianity has always been about. Christianity is not meant to be a set of rules of do's and don'ts or rituals or doctrines. Christianity is meant to be a relationship. In fact, such a strong relationship that Jesus calls us to follow him to the point that we literally give up the path of our life, the direction we want for our life, and submit ourselves to and align ourselves to follow the path that Jesus has for us, to go on this journey with him. But why would people do that? Why would anyone follow someone at that level? Because I don't, I don't know about you. Um, 
I probably would not, I'm not going to submit my life to someone just because they're a really good teacher or just because they live a perfect life or just because they're really wise. Now, Jesus was all of those things, but that's not why we follow Jesus. I'm not going to submit my life to someone just because of those things. I'll, I'll try to listen to them. I'll try to grow from them. But the reason we submit ourselves to Jesus is because of the cross and the resurrection. There's a guy who's much smarter than me named Timothy Keller. He's a pastor and theologian. He says this, If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. That's what it all comes down to. We can't call ourselves Christ followers unless we hang on to that one truth. And so today I want to look at a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, not your, maybe your normal passage that you would look at for Easter Sunday. Um, but this is written by Paul, the Apostle Paul, uh, to the, Corinth church, the church in Corinth. Um, I want to encourage you, if you have a Bible, open it up. Or if you've got a, a phone, I would even encourage you to turn there on in your, if you have a Bible app on your phone. I will have it on the screen, but I love when you look yourself, because one, you can highlight it. Uh, two, you can have better reference of where things are. Paul, who didn't give his life to Christ until after the resurrection, has this to say to the church in Corinth. He starts with verse 1. He says, now I would remind you, brothers. Now just hang on right there. He says, I would remind you. So he's going to now say, I'm, I'm reminding you about something you've already heard, something we've already talked about, but it's important, so I'm reminding you. Anyone else ever need reminders about things that are important in life? I know I do, right? I, I, I need to be reminded of things that are important in this life. <clears throat> I get too distracted. I get caught off guard. I get busy doing other things. If you've ever raised kids, you know kids need reminding about things over and over and over again. Uh, Tanya's pet peeve, my wife, one of her pet peeves is cups being left around the house. And so Tanya dreads summer because the kids are all home all day and they leave their cups all around the house. And I, I know as a kid's growing up, I it, know at least five to seven times I remember hearing her in, a, in the same day. Be reminding the kids, the cups don't go on end tables when you're done. They don't go on the counters when you're done. They don't even go in the sink when you're done. When you're done, they go in the dishwasher, right? And she'd have to just keep reminding them. I, I, don't, I still, they come to our house as adults, and I still don't think they ever really got it. But, um, but I, I, have to be remind, I have to be reminded of really important things, like that I'm watching my children. Um, I, Tanya uh, knows if I'm in charge of the kids and it's not a part of my normal routine, she has to remind me. If she does not remind me, I will usually forget. And this is like all ages. Like I've left kids places. I, I'm that guy. I'm just like, I, what if, I know I'm supposed to. Oh, yeah, the kids. Um, I've left them different places. I forget to pick them up. Uh, I'm really bad. So she knows that I have to be reminded. And so Paul is saying, hey, I'm going to remind you now of something that's very important. In fact, we're going to see he thinks it's the most important. Look at what he says. I remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. Verse 3 is key here. Look at verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried... And that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. You hear this? You hear what he's saying? Listen, this is of first importance. There's all sorts of other things you're going to learn and you're going to hear when it comes to your teaching and your walk and your faith. But the, the thing of first importance is the cross, the burial, and the resurrection. Everything else is secondary. Everything else comes after that. This is the number one most important thing that we all have to grasp. This is where our faith stands on. And Paul is saying, listen, don't get bogged down in all the other stuff. Remember this as of first importance. 
in our family, if you spend much time with us, uh, we're, we're competitive. We can compete over anything. And we have kind of a mantra in our family. There's first place and everybody else. Nobody cares. I mean, don't say, if you're not in first place, you're just, you're just the everybody else. And, and that's true here is what Paul's saying. Look, the rest of it is just all the other stuff. The first importance is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus' the sacrifice on the cross and the resurrection is first importance. If you don't get anything else today, I hope and pray that you will go home with that ingrained in your head. That you, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, this is what it all stands on. This is what it all hangs on. Because without that, it's just some teachings. You can find good teachings from a lot of different people. Without that, there is no hope. He goes on in verse 5 through uh, 11, he lists the different, pe- different people that Jesus appeared to in, after the resurrection. The hundreds of people that in different places and different times that Jesus appeared to after the resurrection. Just to, kind of, just to basically say, look, remember, he, he died, he rose again, and he appeared to all these different people. So he's kind of ingraining in their heads. But then he jumps back to his point, and we're going to, for sake of time, we're going to jump down to verse 14. And he says this, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. You hear that? Look, if Christ isn't raised, everything we're doing is in vain. This building that we just built is in vain. Us being here, we're just using up an hour. If Christ isn't raised, your faith is in vain. If Christ isn't raised from the dead. He goes on, look at verse 17. He says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. If Christ has not been raised, our faith is futile and we're still in our sins. Why is this so important? I believe it's important because I think every one of us has to ask ourselves whether or not we believe this one thing. Because it really doesn't matter what else you believe. If you don't believe this one thing. Christians get caught up in discussing and debating all sorts of different doctrines and theologies and and events. and, And it all comes down to what do we believe about this? And maybe you're in here today and someone did drag you here and you're a cynic. You question you know, you don't, it might be like, okay, I see some good in the Bible, but I, the, all the, the miracles and the, the, the spiritual aspects, uh, the supernatural, I, I just, I don't buy it. I get it. I was a cynic myself at one time in my life. And don't ever let someone tell you that, well, you just need to accept it blindly. And this, this is why I think this is important. Because I think a lot of us, even if we grew up and we've been in the faith for years, we kind of just buy into this. Well, you just accept faith blindly. You accept, you, you accept things uh, that the Bible says blindly. I would never tell someone to do that. I think that's, that's not very smart. I'm not going to use the word I normally use. Uh, that's not very smart. Because the Bible, God made our brains. He calls us to use our brains. We should accept it based on some amount of evidence. Now, anything we believe that you weren't there to see, you believe with some level of faith. So you have to do, you do have to have faith. But faith and blind faith are two different things. Right? I have faith that my car is going to turn on when I start it. Why is the why? Because I have no idea how that works. So I just I have faith that it's going to happen. I, I, it, it's happened enough times. There's enough evidence. I believe that's what's going to happen. And when it doesn't happen, I'm disappointed. I have, we have faith that di- different people have existed throughout history because there's a certain amount of evidence to those things. We can have faith in the resurrection because there is a certain amount of evidence. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that the resurrection actually happened. Now, I don't have time today to dig into all of it, but I'm just going to share one small way we can have some, we can have some researched faith in the resurrection. And that is this, that multiple people 
from different scholarly angles have researched the resurrection, seeking to prove it wrong, and actually have come to faith through the process. Let me just give you a few examples. There's a guy named Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel was an investigative journalist, was going to write a book through his investigation proving the resurrection wrong. Instead, he ended up writing a book called The Case for Christ, which talks about the evidence of the resurrection because in his study of it, he came to find there was too much evidence and he became a believer. There's a guy named Josh McDowell who took the same angle from a law standpoint and sought to prove the resurrection wrong. He ended up becoming a believer and writing a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Two books I highly recommend if you're someone who's trying to seek the answers to this. Simon Greenleaf is a uh, law professor who's known as one of the top authorities on common laws of evidence. He researched the resurrection and ended up giving his life to Christ. C.S. Lewis, the literary professor and one of the great minds of the 20th century, he was on the debate circuit. And in his discussions and debates with other scholars, he ended up giving his life to Christ and became one of the, the greatest apologetics teachers defending the faith in the resurrection. There's a man named Sir Lionel LeCou. He's the Guinness Book holder for the most success, as the most successful attorney with 245 consecutive successful cases all around the world. And he says this, I have spent more than 42 years as a defense trial lawyer in many parts of the world and I say unequivocally that the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof that leaves absolutely no doubt. Now, why is this important? I believe it's important because we live in a world that is getting more and more aggressive about attacking our faith. See, we live in a world that spirituality is pretty cool, actually. See, it's cool to be spiritual. In fact, Jesus has actually kind of become cool in our culture. It's cool to talk about Jesus and think about Jesus as long as we don't hang on the resurrection. And as followers of Christ, I think we're constantly being influenced by a world that is trying to pull us away from this one central truth. And here, it's so important because without it, there is no hope in Christ. And so I think as followers of Christ, we need, to, we need to be strong in our understanding of this. And then if you're someone who is a cynic and questioning and looking into it, I want you to understand it doesn't matter what you think about all the other stuff until you come to what you think about this. Jesus is the most debated and contested figure in history. And it's not because he was a good teacher. It's because of the resurrection. And if we follow Jesus, it means we need to live as though the resurrection is of first importance. Because, you know, without the resurrection, Jesus actually was not a good teacher or a musician. Um, <laughs> without the resurrection, he was just a narcissist, a lunatic and liar. Why? Because he claimed things about himself it would make him a narcissistic lunatic if they weren't true. John 14, 6, just one small example. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That's just one small example. To say, hey, I'm it. I'm it. You ain't going anywhere without me. I don't know about you, but that's pretty narcissistic if it's not true. So either we accept, hold to, and live by this, or all our talk about Jesus is, as Paul said, vain and futile. See, without the cross and the resurrection, there is no good news in Jesus. Without the cross and the resurrection, Christianity is just a religion, a set of rules and rituals of do's and don'ts, doctrines and morals, and it offers no hope. When Jesus called his followers to follow him, he wasn't calling them to learn a new standard in which to live by. 
He was calling them to fo- he was calling them to follow him so that they could experience hope and freedom like they'd never experienced before. And when he calls us to follow him today, it's not so we can find a better way to live. Although I do believe you will find a better way to live in following Jesus. But it's so that we can experience the hope and the freedom of the cross and the resurrection. And Paul tells us that it is of first importance that we understand that if Christ is not God in the flesh himself, sacrificing himself for our sins on the cross and defeating death through the resurrection, then our faith is, as Paul says, vain and futile. Now next week, we're going to start something I want to invite all of you to join us with. I want to invite all of you because I do truly believe this is so important. If what Jesus said about himself is true, I don't know about you, but but no matter where you stand, to me, it's worth spending some real time digging into it. Even if if you've been following Jesus for years, I think this is a, a good, important thing for you to do because it will help you have a stronger foundation to stand on. But if you've never followed Jesus, and this is a new thought for you, This would be a great way for you to say, hey, you know what? At least I'm going to put the time in. I'm going to put some effort into this. And I'm going to really look into this thing before I make a decision on it. So we want to invite you to join us with this as we start this journey with Jesus. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to be start by, we're going to be looking at the book of Luke. The book of Luke chronicles Jesus' life, his teachings. And ultimately, his death and resurrection. And we'll be looking at that on Sunday mornings together. Talking about it through all the the different passages. Looking at every passage in Luke. But then we're going to do some other things. On Wednesday nights, we're going to start a new thing called Table Talk. And we're going to keep our regular community groups, if you're in one, continue going to one. Hopefully they'll join us with this. But this evening on Wednesday nights is going to be designed, it's going to be here at the church, for you to be able to sit in groups of six to eight people around the table and actually talk through this stuff. We'll have questions to help lead you and guide you, but you can come with your own questions as well. And you can dig into it together and and really chew on this stuff. Because I don't know if you know this, but the best way to really learn something is to dig into it for yourself and then to discuss it with other people and apply it. So we're going to be having that. There's going to be stuff for the kids on that same night where they're going to learn and grow as well. In September, Spud's going to move the youth night to Wednesday nights, back to Wednesday nights so that, so that we can have the youth on the same night. And, and we'll have this, this whole place will just be we're with people learning and growing together. Another thing is we would love to get one of these in everyone's hands. This is a Journey with Jesus journal that we created. Um, and I'm really proud of our team. They put, did an awesome job putting these together. It's got tools in here, resources. It's got a weekly reading program where you'll read what we're teaching, but you'll also read other passages that support that, uh, that uh, passage. There's memory verses for every week that come from those passages. There's a place for you to take notes, prayer journals. You can even bring it and take your Sunday sermon notes on it. It's got everything you need. If you finish this, you'll have your own personal commentary on the book of Luke. So now these cost us a little bit to make, so we do have to charge for them. They're going to be 10 bucks starting next week, um, and we want to encourage everyone to grab one. But today, because we want everyone to get, get one of these, today they're 5 bucks. And uh, so these are gonna, they're out there. We'd love you to get it. If for any reason you cannot afford that, please just tell us. We'll make sure you get one, okay? But uh, we would love you to get one of those because we believe this is a great thing for us to do together. And throughout the year, we'll be adding other resources and things that we (coughs) can have. This is so important because either Jesus was a nut and a liar who pulled off the greatest hoax ever, or he was who he said he was, and the resurrection happened. If it did happen, just think about what that means. It means that we can put our faith in the living God. 
The God who chose to come and live among us, to make himself approachable to everyone. You know, there's not one place in the Bible where we read about people being afraid to approach Jesus. That, that, that no matter where they were in life, no matter how much sin they've committed, no matter what they've done in their life, they were not afraid to approach Jesus. And that's what that means. It means if Jesus is who he says he is, it means that the God, the maker of all things, the ruler of the universe, purposely made himself approachable to the point that no matter where you are in your life, no matter what you've got going on, he wants you to be with him. He wants you to come to him. It means that the cross is no accident. It means that Jesus did not die as a political martyr, like some would say, but rather it was a calculated choice, a, be- a plan from the very beginning of time that God made the ultimate sacrifice to convince us that he will go to any lengths to be with us. And it means that through that great sacrifice, our sins are forgiven not based on anything we've done, but based on his love. And finally, it means that we too can rise again as Christ did. We can have victory over death with him. And I'll close with this. Some of you heard me say this last week, but I feel it is important to say again. When I was at a stage in my life where I was trying to decide if I believed And I had, if I was going to have faith and follow Jesus, I was in a very cynical period. I was questioning everything. And someone once said to me, they said, Shane, if there is no God, then nothing matters. Think about it. If there is no God, really nothing matters. Do what you're going to do. It doesn't matter. Your your morality versus your morality, it doesn't matter. You're all just choosing it subjectively. Maybe seek to be a good person if you can. That'd be a good idea. But outside of that, nothing matters. But if there is a God, if there's a creator of all things, if there's a a Lord of the universe, if there's there's someone who has put this order together and he knows the plans and he cares about you, if there is a God, then nothing else matters. It's the one question every one of us should pour into to figure out rather than just kind of going, well, I've already decided. I, I don't believe it. It's something we should probably put a lot of effort into. See, if Jesus is crazy and there's nothing to his claims, then honestly, it's silly that we're even here this morning. I could have slept in. But if he is who he says he is, then isn't it worth taking a year of your life to dig into it a little deeper and to understand it better and to know and grow in a relationship with him? He gave everything to be in relationship with you. And then what's left is we just get to love him. We just get to be in relationship, and I think that's all, you know, like, I really wanted. You know, I wanted to um, not have to um, just do X, Y, Z in order to be acceptable to my Father in Heaven, Um, that I can have a relationship with Him now.